Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to our audience on the live stream and webcast. You're joining the press conference on data-driven development, and this press conference is serving as a platform for the launch of the Pathways for Progress report, which has been prepared by the Forum's Global Agenda Council on Data-Driven Development. I'm joined today by a very distinguished panel to talk about the subject. True to the Forum's multi-stakeholder approach, we have uh, voices from various sectors. Let me quickly introduce them to you. To my immediate left is Alan Marcus, who is a, a senior director at the World Economic Forum and also the head of our um, information technology and telecommunications industry. Um, further down the road, we have um, Professor Alex Pentland. He's the Toshiba Professor of Media, Arts and Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Um, further down the line, we have Mikkel Hagström, who's the Executive Vice President for Europe, Middle East, Africa and Asia Pacific of SAS, and also a member of this uh, Global Agenda Council on Data-Driven Development. Further down the line um, is Peter Gabriel. You know him all as a musician, but he's also here as the founder of Real World today and feels also very strongly about the issue. And last but not least, uh, we are joined today by Sam Gregory, who is the program director of Witness. And without further ado, I'm handing over to you, Alan. Uh, thank you. So welcome and thank you uh, for joining us today uh, for us to launch this uh, incredible report, Data Driven Development. Pathways uh, for Progress. This has been written by, in fact, the uh, Global Agenda Council on Data-Driven Development, which uh, we have some members uh, here, as, uh, as announced. Um, data is a lifeblood of sustainable development and holds tremendous potential for transformative positive change, particularly for lower and middle-income countries. Yet despite the promise of a data revolution, progress is not a certainty. A lack of clarity on privacy and ethics, asymmetric power dynamics, a lack, of uh, a lack of understanding of the needs of individuals, and an array of entangled societal and commercial risks threaten to hinder progress. Our new report addresses these complexities and provides a blueprint for progress framed on three key priorities. One is addressing the data deficit, two, strengthening the governance and ethics and use of data, and three, empowering individuals and communities with greater tools and understanding for leverage and use. All three of these tracks link to pragmatic, open, and practical ways for progress, which the Council is actively supporting in a variety of ways. I'd like to invite our panelists now to share a few thoughts on those dimensions, and then we can open up for a discussion. Thank you. So without further ado. Yeah, so this uh, last fall, I had the uh, honor of helping the UN Secretary General put together uh, a report about the importance of data, which he calls the data revolution, uh, in achieving the sustainable development goals. Essentially, you have to be able to know where the poor, the underserved, the displaced are in order to be able to help them. You have to know about the roots of ethnic violence in order to be able to cure them. Data is now an integral part of creating an honorable and equitable world. Um, and while that report is wonderful, and I, I urge you to read it, uh, here at the forum we also bring in uh, the voices of industry and academia. And we see three different things that are needed to go along with the basic declaration of this data revolution. One is that there's a data rev deficit. So it's not the case that everybody has the access to, to data at this point. And it's not just a matter of more devices or more internet connections. It's also that there needs to be a public-private partnership because much of the data ha comes from banks or telcos or companies and we need to build an ecology where we can share data so that we can all do better. Another issue is trust and governance. Everyone is concerned about privacy, about bad actors, authoritarian governments that might uh, turn on their own people. And uh, towards this, we've been talking about what I call the New Deal on data, which empowers citizens with far more control and knowledge about data that is about them, sort of moving us from a current condition, which you could call uh, digital serfdom, into a, a digital democracy. And the final issue is around empowering individuals. Data is not knowledge. To be able to really act on this, 
you need to have data literacy. You need to build capacity for people to understand it. And you need to have local interpretation of what this data means so that you can have local action. It can't all come from some far off office uh, done by experts. And so I think those are the key issues in this report. Thank you very much. Um, so we're moving down the line. Uh, Mikhail, share with us, what's the business perspective on that issue? Is it, is it a threat? Is it something you welcome, this, uh, this data revolution? Yeah, clearly. What we have been working on in the Council is, is to strengthen the governance systems around it and the data ethics piece, the safety, the security. And to that uh, effect, catalyzed uh, by the World Economic Forum, the Council has been working on those topics to form a global coalition uh, of leading experts in all, all the different faculties, uh, ranging from privacy, data, uh, data uh, ethics, governance, civil society, humanitarian aid, and so on. And this multi-stakeholder community uh, will continue its work together uh, to drive um, technical and legal innovations um, to strengthen trust and accountability uh, and the tools for uh, uh, using and accessing the data. And uh, we're going to have a kickoff event in Den Haag, February 24. <coughs> but let me give you a practical example, perhaps, uh, that describes it. We, we do have uh, doctors um, without borders. We don't necessarily yet have data scientists without borders. Um, data scientists that look after um, security, that looks after data quality, that looks after uh, privacy. Uh, so if you think of a case like the typhoon Haiyan in, in, in the Philippines uh, that we lived through, the NGOs needed the data from us, uh, from the companies. Uh, and as a company, there are a lot of legal uncertainty around handing over the data to an NGO, but you do want to help. Uh, so clearly, when it comes to field-based uh, access of data that they already have, it's easy to help. And that made a big difference. That saved a lot of lives because in the crisis, they could determine what equipment they needed to send, where. And it turned out that what was needed was most was diesel uh, because the generators to the hospitals weren't running, but that wasn't necessarily what was in the shipments. And that diesel had been taken by the locals. They wanted to get off the island and have it to their boats. But if we then take it the next step, when you want to predict to prevent or predict to prepare, you're going to need more data. And, and, and it was touched on earlier by the professor when he touched on the fact that we need to have location data. Location data is more personal. It's not anonymized. Uh, so there we have, might need to flip the script and, 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 and have the more sensitive data in a safer location and perhaps take the question, take the model to the data. And um, there is, in fact, a blog on this uh, on the website if I am allowed to promote it uh, today. Uh, based on the model lab. So these are some of the topics we are discussing and, and getting together, and, and, and certainly the viewpoint from all the different um, legal, social, ethical um, uh, uh, constituents becomes very important in order to create an approach where we can actively share the data and use it for, for the um, you know, um, improvement of society. Thank you very much. I think uh, that's uh, very important to, to have the insights from the business community on that. And uh, by all means, promote, uh, let's promote your blog post. So please go to, to uh, uh, www.forum.org and, and read it. Um, uh, but um, let's, uh, let's hear from Peter Gabriel what his perspective on, on, this, uh, on this data revolution is. Uh, why is it an issue close to your heart, Peter? Share with us. Well, I think it's a bit like um, when computers were introduced or the internet. You know, none of us really got the full potential of how that was going to impact our lives. You know, and, and in many ways, we're, we're just uh, living data and we're creating, generating data all the time. I think it's going to be <coughs> of huge importance um, who owns and controls this data. There will be data wars coming. And yet, what is this stuff that they're calling the new oil? Um, Besides being very powerful for business, it, it is, has enormous potential for people because what it allows is to make the world visible. Uh, and when you can see it and feel it and watch it, then you can start feeding it into sort of ecosystems built around problems and making sensible decisions and making actions, whether emergency, short-term or long-term solutions. Um, actually count and mean something to people. You know, I, 
I feel that the mobile phone, too, particularly, is the that the instrument that most excites me. I think that's going to transform our world um, more than anything else uh, we've ever invented, and it gives access um, to people to education, to healthcare, and they can start using that data, controlling it. You know, Sandy's been working on his personal data storage idea too. Uh, uh, and that can also be the basis of allowing uh, people with no money, um, but hopefully a telephone, which I think will be the case in a lot of parts of the world, uh, a chance to create um, something of value and be part of uh, a world economy. So um, I think it is uh, of huge importance, this data revolution uh, may be uh, as important as the internet revolution. So. In our particular field, which Sam will now talk about, uh, of, of human rights, uh, I think it's going to be vital and provide uh, people that suffer um, many opportunities and a new set of weaponry through which to defend themselves and get justice. Thank you very much. So Sam, um, tell, us, tell us about what, what Peter already mentioned. What, what role can, can data play in the defense of human rights? So, so I think there's, there's two sides to the question. One is how it can support the defense of human rights, and the other is how do we grapple with the human rights risks. Um, within the vast volume of data that is both purposefully generated and out there as data exhaust, you know, we've experienced over half a million purposefully created videos from Syria that might show war crimes. There are hundreds of millions of photos on Facebook. You know, the questions become how do we find the needle in the haystack? How do we understand that haystack? And how do we understand the field? so that we can you know, warn communities more quickly uh, if there is danger. Uh, we can mobilize communities worldwide with accurate information. Uh, we can hold accountable perpetrators by really demonstrating what's going wrong and eventually predict and prevent, obviously, the ultimate goal. Um, at Witness, we focus on the power of uh, individuals with camera phones in their pockets and how the data those phones create, which is that complex combination of photos and videos and internet and metadata, uh, is used to, to create change. Um, and for us, the first principle, and I think it's very reflected in the WEF work, is uh, pushing the power to the individual to make the choice about the data that they share and its usage as much as possible. So an example of the work very directly in a human rights context for us uh, is we push for companies to integrate a proof mode in their devices that enables people to choose to add data into it that makes it more useful as evidence, more findable, more valuable as a data point. Uh, but also to choose sometimes to take data out of purposefully created media because there are great risks to individuals. You can be identified from a single piece of media or also an aggregate set of data that you create, uh, uh, the unanticipated risks there. Uh, I think it, you know some of the elements that I think very powerfully come through from a human rights side when I read the report um, you know, is the idea of using data for good but recognizing the vulnerabilities of individuals, um, both in our societies where there is developed rule of law, but you know, as you look at uh, a data set, there are risks of discrimination, of new forms of redlining, of ways in which uh, governments and institutions use aggregate data that discriminate against individuals and groups, um, but also the vulnerability of specific people who can be identified in places where there is recrimination against individuals. Uh, I also want to pick up on, on Sandy's point that it's not about just access to the data and the data set, but not everyone is yet in the data set and just making sure that we're not contributing to inequalities that way. Um, and finally, just to note again this emphasis on, on really pushing control and agency and understanding to the individual um, as much as possible, recognizing the risks there, uh, and knowing that, of course, these data sets, if we want them to have real value, might need to have value over many years and over contexts that are not just the single incident. Uh, and really grappling with that through a human rights lens seems uh, tremendously important right now. Thank you very much. Um, I see we have a question here, um, and we have a microphone coming. For the sake of our online audience, could you state your name and organization, please? Yeah. Thank you. Luis Miguel González, El Economista de México. Thank you. Um, I, I will try to say it the most respectful way. You all, you all come from developed countries. Um, I think one of the problem, perhaps, is the interaction between the well-intended people in developed countries and the reality in the in the not so developed world. I mean, in in some places there are problems with the data that belongs to the dictatorship. In other in other countries are just poverty. 
but if the if this kind of initiative has some kind of protagonism from the the developed countries, I think it's a, in a way it's a risk. Mm. Okay. I don't know if if I I was I I've been making my point clear. Yes, absolutely. And I think to, to this point, uh, Professor Schwab mentioned uh, uh, in the recent days that uh, the new, new global context, the theme of this meeting, um, uh, one of the, the main themes there is the lack of trust. And I think uh, the building of governments and the empowerment of individuals speaks, speaks to that. And, and Peter, you mentioned mobile phones. Sam, you mentioned the, the empowerment, making sure that there's no inequality in data. I think all these, these points speak to your question. But I think, Alex, uh, if you would address uh, that, please. I, I think there are two points I'd make. One is uh, in the report to the UN Secretary General, which is, what we do today results in millions of babies dying, millions of people dying from ethnic violence because of a lack of data. And so uh, we are forced by moral concerns to try and do better than we do today. And we've been given this new source data, which is Promethean. Could be bad, could be good. Uh, because we cannot allow those millions of people to die without trying to do something, we have to try and turn that force to good. I don't think that there's any moral choice in the matter. The other thing, though, that I would say is that I run an entrepreneurship program for people from the developed uh, world. So we have 120 people every year who are people from all over the global south. And what we find is that they're very excited about data, about the way that you could begin to bring services to poor people that previously were invisible. Those services could be toilets, those services could be food, those services could be many things. Uh, one example is uh, uh, one group is making uh, navigation aids for cars and trucks, except in this navigation aid you can see where there are barricades with terrorists and you can see where there are IEDs. And where they come from, that's the biggest issue. And as Peter and, and so forth were saying, um, you know, you don't want to get caught with that data. So it's very sensitive and, and privacy and, and control is a really critical thing. Uh, but, but we have the possibility to change these circumstances. Could, could I add to? Um, no, I, <clears throat> I certainly get your point about dictator and, and who's controls the data, but I think that's partly why it's so important. But to me, the argument is reminiscent of uh, people talking about the impact of the mobile phone, because it was, well, this is something in the wealthy, connected world, and it is so evident now that actually when it gets out there, it really gives people who don't have money an opportunity a new means of getting education, health care, access to communication, to economy, to economic knowledge, you know, of their growing things, of market prices. And the phone, you know, is now an accepted uh, essential part of life for, for all but two billion people. Uh, I think the same argument will apply to this. This is early days, you know. We're here in an empty room. This subject isn't sexy. But sure as hell, uh, in 10 years' time, I think it's going to be very different. Thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, mindful of the time, uh, we would close the panel here. Let me thank you very much on behalf of the World Economic Forum, all of you to join this session. And uh, thank you for watching. Thank you.